Two weeks ago we did a poll and asked you which of four elements you would like us to discuss. And you chose technetium. Now this element is number 43 and it has an extraordinary history. It shows us how beautiful science is and it also has some special applications that we will discuss. Welcome to Cube Chemistry, where we will discuss all the elements of the periodic system and also do experiments. And if you like this video and want to see more, make sure to subscribe. Also, if you want to influence next week's experiment, make sure to fill in the poll. Now I can imagine this is a little bit of a disappointment. I mean this cube has a placeholder instead of the real element. Well, the reason for that is that technetium is a really rare element and is also very expensive. I found places where I could get this cube, but unfortunately it would be above my pay grade. Nonetheless, if you want to collect all the elements of the periodic system, you can still buy these placeholders to complete your whole collection. Now, if you would like that, click on the link below, fill in the code, you will get a 10% discount and also you will be helping our channel. So for now we have to go for this beautiful placeholder. Now this element deserves more of a backstory since it was an element that was missing for a long time in the periodic table. Now let's take a look why it took scientists so long to find this element. In the late 1800s Dmitry Mendeleev has just published his periodic table, a grand framework that categorizes elements according to their properties. But the table had gaps in them, spaces that indicated something was missing. One of these voids is atomic number 43, an element Mendeleev called Eka Manganese. He predicted that it should sit in the column of manganese and rhenium, but no one had ever seen it. It was a phantom, taunting chemists to find it. For decades, scientists chased after this elusive element. There were false alarms, like in 1925 when Ida Nodek and her colleagues claimed to have found it and named it Missourium. But their evidence wasn't convincing. And the hunt continued. It seemed almost mythical, an element that existed only in theory, hiding in the shadows of the periodic table. The story takes a dramatic turn in 1937 with Emilio Segre, an Italian physicist with a knack for chasing the impossible. That year, while visiting the University of Palermo, he got his hands on a piece of molybdenum foil that has been bombarded with deuterons at the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory in California. Most people would see a piece of metal, but Segre decided to try something with it. Now, together with his colleague, Carlo Perrier, he painstakingly analyzed the foil, breaking down its elements and searching for something, anything that might fill the empty slot on the periodic table. And there it was. In the residue, they found evidence of a new element. Now, what did they do? The irradiated molybdenum foil was first dissolved in acid to break down and create a solution that would allow them to separate the different elements and isotopes present. This step was necessary to make the individual elements accessible for chemical separation. Now, Segre and Perrier used selective precipitation and fractional crystallization techniques, which involved adjusting the pH and concentration of the solution to selectively precipitate specific elements while leaving others in the solution. They used this approach to separate technetium from molybdenum and other potential contaminants. Although advanced ion exchange resins weren't available at the time, Segre and Perrier used basic ion exchange principles to separate technetium based on its chemical behavior in different oxidation states and its tendency to form particular complexes. This allowed them to differentiate technetium from chemically similar elements like molybdenum and rudenium. Segre and Perrier exploited technetium's chemical behavior in various oxidation states, especially since technetium forms stable oxides and complex anionic species that could be selectively isolated. For example, technetium can exist in the plus 4, plus 5, plus 6 and plus 7 oxidation states, which affect its solubility and chemical behavior, allowing it to be separated from molybdenum. As they isolated fractions of the material, Segre and Perrier used radiometric detection techniques to monitor the radioactive decay of each sample, identifying technetium by its unique radioactive signature. This step was crucial for confirming the presence of technetium, as the new element's radioactivity distinguished it from other elements. Now, why would they chose the name technetium? Well, the choice was deliberate. It came from the Greek word technetos, which means artificial. And this wasn't just a nod to its man-made discovery. 
It was a declaration of the future. For the first time in history, an element wasn't dug out of the ground or extracted from a mineral. It was created in the lab. Technetium became a symbol of what human ingenuity could accomplish. Making nature's hidden secrets reveal themselves through sheer persistence and innovation. Now what makes technetium unique isn't just its origin. It's a metal with a split personality. Shiny and silver in appearance, technetium behaves much like its neighbors in the same column, manganese and rhenium, when it comes to chemical reactions. But unlike its siblings, technetium has no stable isotopes. It's radioactive, always changing, always decaying into something else. Its most common form, technetium-99, has a half-life of 210,000 years. Long enough to stick around, but not forever. Now there is another side to this metal, technetium-99M, a metastable version, which has a half-life of just 6 hours. This instability is exactly what makes it valuable. Why? Because when it decays, it emits gamma rays. And this is perfect for medical imaging. Technetium 99M is like a microscopic flashlight illuminating the body from within to help doctors diagnose conditions with unprecedented precision. So what is the difference then between the two isotopes if they have the same number of protons and electrons? Well, a metastable element refers to an isotope of an element that exists in an excited state with energy in its nucleus. Now, this state is not entirely stable, but it doesn't decay immediately instead. The nucleus remains in its higher energy state for a short period of time before releasing the energy, often in the form of gamma radiation, to transition to a more stable lower energy state. Now, the term metastable specifically applies to the isotope's nuclear state, indicating that it is temporarily stable, but will eventually decay. For example, technetium 99M is a metastable isotope of technetium 99, meaning it is in a temporarily stable, excited state before decaying into a more stable ground state of technetium 99. So let's talk some more about the energy states and how they work. Time scale of motion within the nucleus is uh, 10 to the minus 24 seconds. And we need to take a look at the concept of selection rules. Separately, we can first note that the interaction between charged particles and electromagnetic field is inherently quite weak compared to nuclear forces. Now, I haven't calculated it myself, but I've been told that an electron in an excited atom orbits about 40,000 times on average before finally dropping into a lower energy orbit, emitting a photon in the process. Neutrons are uncharged and don't interact with an electric field directly. So if a neutron needs to change orbit, it relies on how orbital motion indirectly influences the movement of the protons in the nucleus. You can also consider particle spin, which almost doesn't couple with an electromagnetic field at all, in the absence of a permanent magnetic field at least. If one is present, you can also use radio or radar waves to flip the spin, the process that makes MRI scans possible. Thus, when a photon is emitted, the spin doesn't change. So you can only transition to states with the same spin. This is the spin selection rule. If there is no room for a given spin in the lower state due to the Pauli exclusion principle, decay isn't possible. For example, in helium with one electron in the 1s ground state and the other with the same spin in the higher 2p state, such a atom can't emit light because two electrons with the same spin can't occupy the 1s state. There are also selection rules based on the orbit of a charged particle. The location of the charge must oscillate to emit electromagnetic radiation. Excited states where the charge cloud merely expands and contracts won't emit radiation. When a transition is not allowed based on the selection rule, it's called a forbidden transition. Such transitions are usually not absolutely forbidden, but they proceed much slower. For instance, the idea that the spin and orbit of an electron are completely independent quantities is an approximation. In reality, a very small part of the other spin is always mixed in. 
Now classically, as opposed to quantum mechanically, you can imagine this as the electron spin axis not standing perfectly perpendicular to the plane of its orbit, but slightly deviating, like the Earth's tilt relative to the Sun. Due to this small contribution from the other spin, the electron can transition with a very small probability to the lower state where most of its spin wouldn't fit. If an excited state can only decay to a lower energy level via forbidden transition, it has a much longer lifetime. When several selection rules need to be violated for a transition, multiply forbidden, this lifetime can increase dramatically. I think that is the case with the 99M isotope of technetium. Uh, I noticed that 99 technetium is far from the longest lived isotope of technetium. 98 technetium and 97 technetium have half-lives of about 4 million years. Apparently 99 technetium is the isotope that forms in large quantities during the fission of uranium. That's likely why this isotope occurs in trace amounts in nature. A small fraction of uranium decay proceeds through spontaneous fission meaning it doesn't require a neutron capture to occur. Now earlier we touched on the medical applications of technetium. So it is here where technetium really really shines. Over 30 million diagnostic procedures every year rely on technetium 99M. It's used to detect bone cancer, heart disease and other conditions. And it goes something like this. A patient comes in with a mysterious pain. Instead of an evasive surgery or a lengthy test, a small amount of technetium 99M is injected into the bloodstream. As it moves through the body, it highlights areas of abnormal activity on a gamma camera, guiding the doctors to the problem. It's as if technetium 99M becomes the body's storytelling, revealing hidden narratives of health and disease. Technetium isn't just confined to laboratories and hospitals, its story extends to, into the stars. In 1952 scientists detected technetium in the light spectrum of certain red giant stars. So maybe not just that artificial. Now why is that a big deal? Because technetium isotopes decay over time and they don't last long on cosmic timescales, finding it in stars means that these celestial bodies were forging it anew deep in their fiery hearts. It was deep proof that elements could be born inside of stars. Well, that's all fine and well, but are there any other practical applications? Well, in the industrial world, it's used to prevent corrosion. A small amount of technetium added to steel can significantly improve its resistance to rust, especially in environments exposed to moisture and heat, like nuclear reactors. Its ability to serve as a tracer also makes it useful in environmental studies, where it can be used to track movement of materials through soil and water systems. The legacy of technetium isn't just in its applications, but what it represents. Its discovery marked the shift from the age-old practice of finding elements in nature to actively creating them. This was a gateway moment opening the door for the synthesis of other elements beyond uranium, the so-called transuranium elements. Technetium is a reminder that some mysteries can be solved not by waiting for nature to reveal them, but by challenging it head on. It's an emblem of human curiosity, determination and the desire to push boundaries. And if you like this episode and want to see some more, make sure to subscribe. Also, if you think I forgot something, leave it in the comments. See you next week.